Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Wherever you are joining us from, welcome back to the second part of the RSET training, Satellite Remote Sensing for Urban Heat Islands. As a reminder, all webinar recordings, PowerPoint presentations, and the homework assignment can be found after each session on the training page at the link provided below. There will be one homework assignment that will be posted following next Tuesday's training. The homework must be submitted via Google Forms, and the due date for the only homework assignment is December 1st. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the due date. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. As a brief recap of what we covered last week in the first part of the webinar series, we focused on land surface temperature based urban heat island mapping. We summarized the characteristics, causes, and impacts of urban heat islands. We identified the satellites and sensors used in analyzing urban heat islands by land surface temperature. We recognize the limitations of satellite data for urban heat island analysis, and we replicated the steps of converting data from the Landsat series of satellites to land surface temperature estimates using Google Earth Engine. For the second part of this three-part webinar series, we are delighted to have as a guest presenter, Dr. Vivek Shandas. Dr. Shandas will be presenting his work integrating in situ observations with satellite imagery for mapping urban heat. Dr. Shandas is a professor at Portland State University in Oregon, where he specializes in developing strategies for addressing the implications of climate change on cities. His teaching and research examine the intersection of exposure to climate induced events, governance processes, and planning mechanisms. Dr. Shandas serves as the research director for Portland State University's Institute for Sustainable Solutions, where he supports cross-disciplinary efforts to address pressing challenges facing communities around the world. He also serves as the executive on the executive committee and is the Portland co-lead for the National Science Foundation-sponsored Urban Resilience to Climate Extremes, where he conducts research to understand how cities can transition into more sustainable futures. He is also the principal investigator for the Canopy Continuum Project, where he works with the U.S. Forest Service and state and county health departments to research how trees improve birth outcomes by mediating urban heat and air quality. We are honored and delighted to have Vivek join us today to present his work integrating in situ observations with satellite imagery for mapping urban heat. And without further ado, I will pass the presentation over to him. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to present some of our work uh, that's in this case titled Integrating in situ observations with satellite imagery for mapping urban heat. My name is Vivek Shandas, and I'm at Portland State University and have been engaged in these integrative efforts on a variety of different uh, time and spatial scales, which I'm delighted to talk to you about today. Um, just want to set the stage a little bit um, first before we get into some details. The uh, seminar that you may have attended, uh, the first seminar, was really focusing on satellite-derived measurements of urban heat. And so this in situ observation is an attempt to complement what you already heard in no way replace it and really provide a means by which you can find a more robust way to uh, understand the distribution of heat in your community. Um, I want to start with uh, some general background. So in terms of background and context for understanding urban heat, I just want to bring to your attention the fact that there is a long history of this in terms of understanding how cities are very different than their surrounding areas. In fact, that was one of the earliest observations uh, written in English, French, German, Spanish, and then later Japanese uh, of a series of research studies that goes back over 137 years where we're really talking about how a city, because of the way that it was built, because of the various infrastructure in place, 
was me was moderating the way in which the sun's rays or the shortwave radiation, as we'll talk about in a minute, was affecting the uh, surfaces and the built environment. And so what historically was often done was to find the observe, find and observe differences between the city and its surrounding areas. And hence this classic example of the urban heat island. More recently, we started getting into descriptions about what's actually causing those differences in heat. And in fact, what's happening at a very local level within even a neighborhood. So the, the recent work has really taken the broader concept of an urban heat island and made it more granular, if you will. And so if we're measuring progress over time, we're really starting to think about how development and the use of specific methodological standards for assessing urban heat. And we're right now in a real, um, a real growth in terms of those methods. We've seen all different forms of satellite-derived imagery, as you saw in the first session, with uh, now a lot more emergence of in situ or ground-based measurements, near surface temperatures, as they're also called, uh, starting to emerge as, as methods. And part of this is really about finding effective applications to planning and what you can do to mitigate urban heat. Um, as the planet warms and as we're seeing longer uh, heat waves, more intense heat waves and more frequent heat waves in many parts of the world, part of what we're trying to do is design our cities, design our human um, our human habitable spaces in such a way where that heat is not so acute and actually can be tempered by the materials, by the surfaces, and by the various ways in which we build our, our uh, communities. And so the opportunities for climate adaptation really open themselves up in, in the more recent understanding of how we're measuring progress. So with that said, we would get into a discussion about what's actually happening when the sun's rays are coming onto the earth or really any other planet that we know of. What we see is a lot of um, shortwave radiation, very energy packed um, um, rays coming down from the sun and those are hitting the surface. And what we see is some of that is absorbed by the earth itself. Some of it is reflected by the atmosphere and some of it is absorbed by the atmosphere. And what we end up seeing is a three different forms of heat that finds its way to our skin. Um, and that can, that's actually done through heating of the ground. So this is essentially ground heat. And then there's also sensible heat when the sun's rays actually heats up the actual uh, air around us. And then finally, we have latent heat, which is when water evaporates and we actually can see, can, can experience what happens as that water evaporates and becomes part of the air column itself. And so these three forms really matter when we're talking about integrating the satellite derived and the in situ observations of heat. Often the way that we've talked about urban heat, as I'll bring your attention back to the reference site model, or that is the classic way of taking a reference site, usually away from an urban setting, and that is a stationary sensor that measures temperature, sometimes humidity, and it, there's another uh, proximate sensor that's within a city, someplace within the boundary of a city. And that difference is what we're really talking about in terms of the spatial gradient of heat. And what we can get with those stationary sensors is also nighttime differences where we're actually seeing how the urban environment doesn't cool down a great deal during the night and actually some parts of it don't cool down very much at all and other parts of it cool down a lot and we'll get into that in, in just a minute. Though that difference is really the traditional reference site model. As you heard from the last uh, webinar on this series, there's also a satellite drive or land surface temperature approach where we're essentially talking about the atmospheric brightness and emissivity, which is a fancy way of saying the amount of uh, solar radiation that a material can absorb and reflect back. And we also have the idea of integrating satellite with ground-based measurements, which is what we'll be doing, what we'll be talking about today. And the aim of this particular approach of integration is to really develop predictive models of air temperatures. That's where the field is right now. There's a canon of literature really trying to uh, describe how you can, one can use a handful of stationary weather station, weather um, instruments to be able to uh, 
uh, assess how the temperature varies across time and space. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. So to integrate these satellite and ground-based methods, um, the literature seems to suggest four primary ways in which this can be done. One can take weather station data. So um, there's a suite of distributed, sometimes community science or citizen science distributed campaigns to get um, weather station or temperature data. There's other approaches that have um, attempted to take uh, various um, either state or local city or even national measurements that are uh, a handful of them that might be available in a city setting and try to use those to calibrate and look at satellite derived data. And so the idea here is you take a satellite imagery of land surface temperature and you can use that to essentially um, predict or uh, calibrate what's happening in the air. And so what you're what we're essentially talking about is collecting uh, data at, from multiple days, years, and over a large study area. And sometimes the challenge there is that we only have very few stationary uh, instruments, weather instruments, in one city. So it makes that kind of ex spatially exhaustive approach somewhat challenging. The idea here is to predict t uh, temperature, the maximum temperature, the minimum temperature, and the mean temperature in using this particular approach of, of a uh, ground-based measurement. Uh, MODIS, which you heard about in the last session, is probably the wi most widely used imagery to obtain land surface temperature. And it's uh, really helpful because it has very high temporal resolution, uh, relatively core scale, one kilometer when we're talking about kind of um, planning or uh, guiding uh, planning decisions on the ground. Those one kilometer grid cells are often very difficult to know whether a mitigation action has made really much of a difference in a specific location. So it might be challenging in terms of that specific application. Um, we, you t heard about the Terra and the Aqua uh, as well uh, in the last session. I don't want to spend too much time on that, though I will uh, get into these other data sets that have thermal bands, which you've also heard about in the last session. And so with that, there are several different approaches in terms of the satellite-derived data sets. The ground-based approach, um, there's really no need for land surface temperature, uh, those thermal bands that we were just talking about. We're uh, developing some techniques that are attempting to use a higher spatial resolution of 10 meter grid cells. That's the native resolution um, for these particular satellite-derived images. And there's a large number of in situ data that, as I was describing in the previous slide, help to validate and calibrate those satellite-derived measurements. Um, in this case, we can use land cover data from that high spatial resolution at 10 meter to be able to describe what's happening in terms of air temperature. And I'll get into the, how we do that in a minute. Um, with ground-based measurements, we can also, uh, it's just about going out and measuring this. So you can get morning time if you have a stationary sensor or if you have a mobile sensor, which is the one I'll be talking about today it, at greater length. You can go out at specific times of the day at 6 a.m., at 3 p.m., 7 p.m., and get a full diurnal profile of what the temperature might look like in a particular place. As you could imagine, when you have multiple time periods of data, we can start getting at what are the areas that cool down the most and what are the areas that stay hot continuously. And so those become very important touch points for us to know which areas might require intervention in terms of heat mitigation strategies. So how do we how do we do this? We have what we are referring to as a heat watch engagement model where we um, talk to communities and engage uh, communities at the local level with often a climate action plan that's underway or an adaptation plan or a resiliency plan that's underway. And we engage in those conversations to um, figure out what would be the most effective way for engaging a community to measure temperature across a vast area. We also then develop analytical tools, which I'll just touch on briefly um, for examining scenarios of adaptation action. And then finally, we are able, we provide some support for capacity building of engagement with decision makers. And so if you go to the next slide, I'll show you how it works. Um, we, as we engage for a heat campaign, and that's really what we're talking about, is a mobile heat campaign where we're actually going out and collecting in situ measurements all in one day or over a span of a week, depending on the conditions in the local site. 
but we really engage organizations to, uh, to identify what might be heat actions that they are looking to take. Then we um, engage the communities by providing instruments, actually temperature and humidity sensor um, instruments to be able to mount on bicycles, on cars, even walking traverses are possible. And there's a whole campaign uh, series of routes that are drawn in a particular area where participants go out and collect these measurements. These measurements are done at three times during the day so that we can get that diurnal profile and only for one hour. And that hour is really important because it reduces the likelihood of thermal drift, the idea that as the as materials heat up and as the sun changes um, in the horizon or, or, or in the sky, it changes the effect of those sun's rays on the specific uh, material that it might be hitting. So what we're really trying to do is constrain the time periods for from a 6 a.m. to a 7 a.m. time period, a 3 p.m. to a 4 p.m. time period, and a 7 p.m. to an 8 p.m. And that can vary depending on the diurnal profile and the latitude that a particular city is. And after we complete that campaign, which I'll uh, describe in a little more detail in the next slide, um, we review the results and we identify potential actions. So a lot of this is about moving a community to taking actions to reduce those acute temperatures in specific areas. The idea here is as we're seeing warmer temperatures, and this is an image of the United States taken uh, from NOAA, we have these specific seven steps that we take uh, for understanding and uh, advancing a heat watch campaign. We really start the, with the community about 10 to 12 weeks ahead of time. It requires a little bit of planning. It's not as if you can go in and grab a satellite image and just start processing it. It actually requires a little bit of planning, so it requires a local organizer to help in setting goals about 10 to 12 weeks out, and then we start establishing what the process might look like, what, who to engage, in collecting the temperatures on these mobile platforms that we uh, support. And then we do a lot of preparation about two to six weeks before to make sure everybody's ready. And that's with a series of training videos and various other materials that will walk each participant through a uh, campaign. And then we activate. We actually start to uh, get everything in place. We use forecasts from uh, uh, the National Weather Service or other uh, local uh, weather advisory bodies and are able to then confirm the availability of volunteers, really get the equipment ready to go. And finally, uh, on the day that's been selected, usually a hot, uh, clear day with usually high pressure uh, system and a low wind. And those conditions really lend themselves to an excellent time to execute the campaign where you have um, in some cases, we have upwards of 80 to 100 volunteers. In other cases, we have 6 to 10 volunteers, depending on the size of the region that we're looking to collect these data in. We go out and essentially have these predetermined routes at 6 a.m., 3 p.m., and 7 p.m. Uh, for an hour each to go out and collect uh, tens of thousands and ultimately hundreds of thousands of individual temperature and humidity measurements that are made. That's the execution. Those data are then sent to us to be able to basically analyze, and it takes about four to six weeks to go through a very thorough data because we're using often volunteers that are, um, in many cases, remunerated for their time, though they're still relatively um, nascent community scientists. And so uh, making sure the data are clean, really consistent with the time, with the location, uh, with the uh, speed that folks are driving. So often we say, um, you know, uh, a, a set speed in the United States, we would say at 10 miles per hour to about 35 miles per hour, that range is really ideal. Um, and so we trim the data and make sure we're using the best data for a series of, um, series of uh, um, um, machine learning algorithms that allow us to mm -hmm. uh, predict temperatures in areas where communities didn't drive. So we're really trying to use the land cover data set, which I'll um, be talking about a little bit in a, a, a little bit more detail later. This is the overview. Um, we use the land cover data to basically predict why the temperature is what it is in specific locations. We create these continuous maps, and that allows us to start investigating what might be happening in specific areas. And finally, the community, six to 10 weeks after we work with them to try to identify what might be mitigation strategies 
for specific places where there might be, for example, communities that are vulnerable to heat or infrastructure that might be vulnerable to heat to help identify mitigation options. So here's an example of a campaign day from 2020. There are communities that went out with these instruments. You can see somebody holding it in their hand. You can see others mounted on their cars. And the idea is that there's just a small little chamber um, at the top of this, and it mounts right on the window of a passenger side of a car. Uh, and then we are able to go out and every one second there is a measurement taken of temperature, humidity, location, and that allows us to very quickly um, record that in a data logger and, the, and that allows us to then um, essentially get uh, many, often uh, thousands of measurements relatively quick in C2 and that allows us also to get that ambient temperature as opposed to that uh, land surface temperature. A couple of the outputs that are generated from this, for example, here's a Miami uh, campaign that we did where we essentially are able to look at a, the city of Miami and identify what are the areas that are really hot from an air temperature point of view uh, in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening, those three periods. And you can see in this case, it happened on the 27th of June with 21 volunteers. There were nine routes that they drove, and they collected about 60,000 measurements uh, that were used in the modeling uh, system. Um, in many cases, the heat differential, meaning what uh, at the same time, what is the difference from one neighborhood to another? What's the maximum we can find in that? In this case, it was about 10 degrees Fahrenheit that we noticed. And um, we're, we're still, we have an, an enormous amount of data that we're able to look at with this as well. And we, all of that is provided back to the community to then further analyze and look at and if we could go to a little web link that um, I provided, and we also provide as part of this a little web link of an interactive ArcGIS platform that allows us to um, very quickly for the volunteers and others to see what's happening um, in a specific location. So in this case, if we look at Miami, we can see the similar map showing up. And through this, we can see the routes and there's some uh, icons down at the bottom of the screen where you can kind of look at the legend and you can um, select on and off. You can see what the temperature range is here and you can go to the layer list, turn on and off. If you just want to see the traverses of where people went, you would turn off the afternoon temperature model. Or if you just wanted to see the temperature model itself and not the traverses. So a lot of interactivity here and we found that communities have uh, been really uh, thrilled to use these kinds of interactive um, applications and you can download these data, integrate them with so social dem sociodemographic data, with land, su land surface temperature data, et cetera, et cetera. So there's many ways to actually go about putting this to use and we've seen these starting to show up in a lot of community resiliency plans. So if we go back to the campaign or back to the uh, slides, yeah, and so from here, if you go to the next slide, um, some what ends up, um, in this case, Boston, it, last year in 2019, where they went out in the July 29th and 30th, we were able to see about 102 degree Fahrenheit was the highest, and there was a heat differential of about 15 degrees. And um, we can really break this down to you know min, max, and mean over different time periods. And the heat index, since we have humidity, satellite imagery cannot pick up on humidity. So we're also able to measure the relative humidity, which then allows for the creation of a heat index. In this case, bringing the temperature max up to 100, and, almost 109 degree Fahrenheit in some parts of the city in the middle of the day. Um, next slide, please. So part of this is about, um, there we go. Um, part of this is about how do we validate this. And so what we've done is a few different approaches. We, we start by taking 70% um, of the data that are collected. We try to predict 30% of the data. And those, generally speaking, for these models are about 98% um, accurate in terms of what we're able to predict from that 70-30, what we call holdout method. And there are other ways also. That's kind of internally within the data. There's other approaches to validating it. Um, by looking at the satellite derived and the ground based temperatures. And so there's different approaches to use, which I'll talk about in a minute as well. And you can compare the ground based stations with mobile temperature, very selective in, in locations. And then finally, you can think about 
conducting repeat measurements of mobile temperatures in one region and comparing across days. Because we do this all in one day often, uh, meteorology may affect what the temperature, what the air temperature is on a specific day. And so when you conduct multiple campaigns, you're actually able to get a much more robust description of what the air temperatures are in a place that you um, are conducting the campaign. We use a we use a technique called random forest, which is similar, which is a, a advanced version. So if you start with a linear regression and try to predict temperatures based on land cover characteristics, um, the linear regression doesn't perform as well as a, a regression tree or a cart regression. That's a regression tree where you're trying to bin specific land covers based on their predictive ability onto a specific temperature measurement. And that allows, um, that allows a, a, a higher level of predictability, though we found that um, using a machine learning algorithm called Random Forest, we've been able to uh, get predictions up the best of any of the models that we've uh, tested so far. And so what we do is essentially take um, bands from a Sentinel-2 satellite image, that's the 10 meter resolution, we're getting a little bit more technical here, um, 10 meter resolution, and that allows us to uh, create multiple buffers around each temperature measurement. And within those buffers are all the land cover characteristics in the location. So we're actually using that satellite derived land cover series of bands that are used um, in this, 13 bands that are used from the Sentinel. And we're able to take each of those bands essentially um, suggest a specific type of land cover. And what we are able to do is we are able to account for a really diverse set of land covers across all of these little buffers that we do around each temperature measurement. And within those buffers are all land cover data sets. And that is what is fed into this machine learning model to identify best predictors of temperature across all the different land covers in a select location. We often use predictors to develop temperature surfaces. And we can see that, for example, high density development or uh, open space or uh, residential, multifamily or single family residential affects uh, temperatures in different ways. And then ultimately what the model is able to do is it takes the, uh, it takes there, it takes all of these um, assigned probabilities of temperature being ascribed to a specific set of land covers and then applies it across the entire study area. So what you end up getting then is a spatially exhaustive description of a specific site. Um, this has several advantages to using traditional geospatial interpolation such as Krieging or inverse distance weighting or, or, or any of those other interpolation techniques because um, if you have two points, one is 90 degrees and one is 100 degrees, the point in between doesn't necessarily need to be 95 degrees. There might be a large park there or something like that that's actually making it 80 degrees or something even cooler. And so what the land cover allows us to do is use an input to improve what accounts for on the ground uh, as opposed to a statistical estimation of what the air temperature is. So we found many advantages to using this land cover approach combined with the uh, machine learning random forest approach. Next slide. We have a few papers on this particular approach, but instead of individual trees that are created through a regression model, it actually creates hundreds uh, or in many cases thousands of trees that are grown to identify what are the uh, weak learners and the strong learners, and then a combination of bagging and random subset of predictors allow us to really accurately predict the air temperatures. And so I want to do a little bit of uh, taking our models and comparing it to um, satellite derived. So the, comparing the mobile uh, in situ observations with the satellite derived observations. And I want to just take you through a few um, places where there are actually some differences, some notable differences um, that, that are worth discussing briefly. And here what we see, it's a lot of data here, but I just wanted to show this to you as a, a somewhat technical exercise where we're using Fahrenheit measurement and looking at five different cities across the US. And each of these, we take several different characteristics of them. And we're using a Landsat uh, 8 image here and comparing that to a near surface air temperature or the NSAT is a near surface air temperature. And we're trying to get 
close the, the dates as close as we can, and we're looking at essentially the temperature differences between the Landsat and the average average temperature in Landsat, and then the average temperature in the near surface um, air temperature. And so what we're noticing is that the highs and lows, as well as the averages, do vary between these two data sets. Our average daily temperature for the near surface tended to be, uh, in most cases, warmer than what the Landsat was describing. And that's an interesting outcome in terms of at least recognizing that there's potentially some mixing of the air column occurring and that temperatures are not necessarily, with a Landsat image, you might find that there's a very hot area of a parking lot, and then right adjacent to that, if there's a park or something, it's a very cool area. And in a Landsat image, those would be very stark differences in terms of uh, the hot parking lot and the cool uh, park. Though with the near surface air temperature, what we see is a mixing of that air column and allows us to actually pick up on maybe something along the lines of the average of all of those uh, temperatures put together. So if we go to the next slide, I have a little bit more detail on this. So here are two cities. One is a um, one is Washington DC, the other is Portland, and we just compare the land surface temperature with the near surface air temperature here. This is Portland, Oregon, and Washington DC on two different coasts of the United States, and we're looking at this in terms of what were the different land covers that may have affected the differences in the temperatures that we're seeing from an air and a satellite-derived approach. So the land covers across the bottom here, and then the temperatures are along the side. We immediately notice that in areas that are um, built up, meaning low density, medium density, or high density urban development, the Landsat, uh, or uh, in, in these cases, what we're seeing is that the Landsat temperature is consistently predicting higher than the near surface air, the, uh, the near surface air temperature. So the red bar here, of, uh, for example, in some of these medium density developments, for example, with a very high bar as it's going up, um, I'm sorry, that's high density development, um, the highest red bar there, that's suggesting essentially about um, upwards of a seven degree difference in terms of uh, temperature, upwards of seven plus degree temperature difference in Portland between the land surface temperature and the near surface air temperature. And whereas in the um, specific land covers that have um, anything related to open space, so that's deciduous forest, green, evergreen forest, mixed forest, shrub, herbaceous, hay, cultivated crops, all those, it seems that the land um, surface temperature is predict or is, is um, indicating a much lower, uh, a much lower temperature than what might actually be on the ground, air temperature there. And so what we're noticing are these patterns that are coming up across at least these two sites, and we're starting to dig into this uh, in a lot more detail because we have an exhaustive, spatially exhaustive Landsat image and a spatially exhaustive modeled air temperature image. And so we can do pixel for pixel differences, and that's essentially what these graphs are representing. We've gone one step further to look at these in terms of the mobile sensors in relation to stationary sensors that are on the ground. So in this case, we have land service temperature and mobile sensors. At mobile sensors, and what we want to do next uh, is look at stationary sensors and um, mobile sensors and compare those. So if we look at Washington DC and we look at all the at least uh, stationary sensors that we can find, these would be from the Environmental Protection Agency, from a network called Purple Air, the P, and then the Weather Underground. The Weather Underground and the P, uh, Purple Air are essentially uh, community science projects. And so we can't rely on those a great deal. We don't know a lot of details, though the Environmental Protection Agency or EPA sensors, um, unfortunately, there are very few of those. There's only two in the Washington, D.C. area, though we use all the others to try to estimate what we're looking at in terms of what our what the mobile sensors were saying versus these stationary sensors, both predicting air temperature. And we're noticing that essentially the predicted temperature and the observed temperature are um, correlated, though um, not very, not super strong. There's some scatter in that, and the difference of about eight degrees, in this case Celsius, is what we're seeing from the highs and the lows. And again, these green triangles and these uh, blue squares are community-based 
campaigns or community, uh, they're often a household that would set up a air temperature monitor and that is linked to a Wi-Fi so that we can scrape those data and essentially see what we're looking at. So this is about as good as we can do with the existing uh, data. And if you go to the next slide, we've, we've looked at a couple of other cities as well, looking at Boston and the next slide will be Sacramento and we're seeing very similar trends. So what we're noticing is these mobile platforms are essentially coming in right in between the scatter of all the other sensors that we're noticing, usually above the EPA sensors and below the purple airs, though right between all of the weather underground data sets uh, of air temperature. And even within the Sacramento, so a very different uh, bioclimatic zone, this is in the arid environment of a um, very Mediterranean climate, and we're noticing that this is a little bit farther uh, there, there are a little bit uh, bigger discrepancies here where we didn't have any EPA sensors that we could uh, identify, but we did use all of the purple air and all of the weather underground sensors to get a sense for what were the highs and the lows. And we were noticing that, again, we're relatively low, but it's right in that mix of temperatures. And it seems to be, um, again, similarly trending upward as we get um, um, these, these sensors as we're seeing the observed versus the predicted. So what can we say about all of this? Uh, part of what I'd like to at least convey is that we do have a lot of strengths with satellite-derived um, sensors, and we do have a lot of strengths with satellite-derived measurements, and so uh, satellite and, and mobile sensors. And so with satellite-derived, we know that we've heard even in the last session that they're freely available. There's a lot of temporal availability. Uh, you can get an intra-urban variation. There's extensive literature on this. Lots of people have been using satellite imagery for a long time, and that there's a potential connection to land use. There's certain land uses that are consistently hotter and others that are cooler. Some of the weaknesses that we've identified are that it can exaggerate temperature ranges, as we've noticed. Um, in fact, we're finding in some cases that trees were identified by satellite as being very cool, and so a lot of people say throw lots of trees down. Though what we're noticing is that when you throw, put a tree down for mitigation, unless that tree is well cared for, watered, taken care of, the hot temperatures that you're putting a tree into really can stress, uh, add additional biological and physiological stress to the tree, and that tree can often have, um, it, it can often die as a result. And so it can, uh, these temperatures and the actions that are taken, it's not to say not to apply trees, it's to be very thoughtful about how to actually include these mitigation options. So it can exaggerate temperatures. It's a coarse pixel size in terms of 30, 90, or one kilometer. 30 meter is uh, pan sharpened or resampled to a uh, smaller resolution than its native resolution. And um, we also find that with satellites, we're getting at rooftops and roads as opposed to the ambient experience. So if you're interested in energy savings and things like that, a rooftop being cool might be helpful, though it might not be helpful for everyday ambient experience that somebody walking around the, um, a particular part of the neighborhood might be experiencing. And as I mentioned earlier, this la these last couple of points, the discrete differences between the land covers is very apparent in satellite imagery. We can see a very clear line between a parking lot and a park when in reality temperature or, or um, the readings may be or the experience may be a little more mixed uh, literally and figuratively. Um, and finally the trans translation to policy is still an open question. Uh, satellite derived um, urban heat maps have been around for a really long time and yet we're not really seeing a great deal of their application into policies yet. It's starting, but it's still relatively uh, young, uh, arguably. And similarly, next slide. So if I uh, spend a little time on ground-based, I can identify several strengths and weaknesses here as well. Um, part of this is that it requires a little bit of planning. It's not just downloading uh, a data set, running a script, and being able to look at these distributions of temperature. It's actually um, a very intentional and deliberate process, and we often um, suggest planning ahead. So usually around, if you're in the northern hemisphere, usually around March uh, or even January, you start preparing, and then by um, March to uh, March in the equatorial regions, Though getting higher latitudes, we would be really talking about July, August as being the ideal times for this. Uh, similar in the Southern Hemisphere, 
but really getting communities, uh, engaging communities from their place. They have a lot of lived experience of what it might feel like to be in a location. And um, developing that civic legitimacy is something we've found that these campaigns can really help to promote. After all, a lot of decisions going into mitigation are political in nature. And when people are more aware of these differences and they participate in these campaigns, they are able to actually legitimize the data, understand where it's coming from. And uh, we've noticed it's been put to action relatively swiftly. Um, we've also got higher resolution in, in the case of using Sentinel data, we're using 10 meter resolution land cover, though we've also used LIDAR data that some cities have access to and create one meter resolution urban heat maps, which can be really helpful when you're thinking about specific interventions and their effectiveness. Um, by, by engaging communities over three times in the day, we can get at this diurnal profile. In fact, if you subtract the evening temperature from the morning temperature, you can even see which areas cool off faster and, and slower in a specific um, region. And finally, as I was mentioning, the policy applications are becoming increasingly evident in, this, in these mobile uh, campaigns. Uh, uh, several weaknesses as well. Um, it does require time and a strategy. It's not free. Um, and that seasonal differences are not yet available. Some people are indicating that you know, winter time is an important period to also see when what the temperatures are like. And that offers us a means to understand seasonal differences, which we don't currently do. We usually only do this in the hot summer period. Um, of course, when we're taking any kind of satellite data, whether it's land cover or Landsat imagery and thermal imagery, clouds and rain can create uh, problems with what you see on the ground um, and what you sense with a mobile platform as well. And then finally, these are all done city by city and there's no generalizable models that are yet developed, though the more campaigns that are done, the more likely that the data will be able to feed into a um, overall campaign. And I just close with my last slide with um, a description about the uh, example of how one could use these uh, air temperature maps. And what we, um, some of us worked with the um, District of Columbia or Washington DC, many maps of which you've seen already. And we wanted to know in one area where it was a public housing complex, where it was uh, subsidized housing for low income communities, what were strategies that could be used to reduce the um, the temperature in those areas? And so what we use is a uh, complex fluid dynamics model and we feed in our air temperature and we're able to look at this diurnal profile and we're essentially able to see um, with this uh, fluid dynamics CFD model called EnviMet, what are the ways in which different treatments on that particular site with green roofs or 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 trees or uh, changing the albedo, the ref reflectivity of surfaces, uh, what would that do in terms of the temperature diurnal profile? And in some cases, we're in this particular place called Greenleaf, which was the um, name of this particular site, we're able to actually model what might happen with these interventions. And that allows us to then get a much more robust idea of what is effective and what's not effective before spending the uh, money on putting in specific interventions. And so the the kind of satellite derived approach, the mobile uh, campaign, and then this particular modeling approach all fit really well together to give uh, communities a better sense for what might be possible in specific locations for mitigating urban heat. So with that, I'll go ahead and close it out and open it up for any questions and discussion that we might have time for. Thank you, Vivek, for such a great presentation. We will now transition to the question and answer part of today's training. As a reminder, please enter your questions into the Q&A box. We will answer them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer doc to the training webpage following the conclusion of the webinar series. Okay, wonderful. It looks like we've gotten a, a number of questions that have been coming in. So we will, again, address them uh, in the order that they were received. Uh, the first question uh, from one of our participants is, uh, can you comment on the original concept of urban areas as islands as opposed to a continuum 
of built up materials from ex urban to urban areas. Um, so this is a good point. Uh, when we're speaking of urban areas and as islands, uh, this is usually due to the concentration of built up area within the, uh, the downtown core. Uh, in reality, this is more of a, a continuum of decreasing built up areas as you go from that urban core to the ex-urban uh, environments and the suburbs. Uh, so due to the dependency of ex-urban areas on the former, uh, the former being uh, the downtown core, uh, they have a higher dispersed residential developments. And there, it is possible that there could be heat islands within uh, ex-urban areas. Uh, but from a health standpoint and from also an observed uh, you know, land surface temperature, what we can observe both in situ and also uh, remotely, uh, urban areas have a higher concentration of built up areas within and among the downtown core. Uh, and this uh, corresponds to higher uh, diurnal land surface temperatures. So um, it is, it is a, a good point. And, and we, I do thank the, uh, whoever the participant was that, that sent that question. This is a very good point. Um, I think we will hand this off to uh, Vivek for maybe answering the next number of questions. So Vivek, do you want to take question number two? Sure. I'd be happy to. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Sure can. Okay. Yeah, so the second question has to do with the applicability of these UHI results. Specifically, can these, uh, can this be linked to CO2 emissions since emissions also lead to warming? Um, in other words, can estimates of UHI be correlated with CO2 emissions? So my, my quick answer to this is that these, uh, at the global level, we're seeing the relationship uh, of greenhouse gases and CO2 being one of them in, in driving uh, increases in, in temperature, though at the intra-urban level, what we have are very different mechanisms at work in terms of why CO2 is produced. Um, CO2 is often produced uh, through uh, combustion or some form of mechanical device that would actually require energy. And with that energy is often coming from places sometimes really far away, sometimes close by, and that energy production is some of the largest contributors of CO2. And while there may be air conditioning or some other mechanical device working at the local um, kind of uh, street block or even household level, attributing um, urban heat to that use of energy is not something that is commonly done, nor is it seem reasonable to actually make those inferences because they are very different reasons why um, those, the, the, the heat is present partly because of the built environment and then very different reasons as to whether someone is running a mechanical device to generate, to drive energy demand. So they're very different in that sense. Um, I'd love to see a study that would start to look at that a little more closely though. So far, I, I, I don't know of any. Um, next question is, how do these community volunteers get motivated to participate? How do organizers, facil uh, uh, facilitators mobilize? Um, that has a lot to do with um, the local partnerships that are developed. And the partnerships are in part between the local organizer and often community-based organiz organizations that are able to galvanize and bring together a group of people to participate. It's um, op it's done in a very bottom up kind of perspective where um, the the community organizers find resources often to remunerate and provide some stipend for participation. We found that these campaigns require about five to six hours of volunteer time, and depending on where you live in the world, in the U.S., we often remunerate. Um, at a particular uh, hourly rate, and that can be provided either $20 or $25 an hour. That includes gas that somebody may be using for the petrol uh, to move around the uh, move around their uh, particular polygon, the training that's involved in preparing people, and then the debriefing of the results. So together, it's about five five ish hours, and um, we roughly remunerate with that uh, dollar amount. We can we can just do the math and come up with a total allotment that's given to the volunteers to participate. We found that not to be a very big problem in almost any one of these campaigns. We've been able to get volunteers. In some cases, there actually in most cases there are probably far more volunteers than we have space for, and so that has rarely been an issue for us. Um, in low resource environment. Um, 
what is the best alternative to measure temperatures? Is, is there an inexpensive instrument method? Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. I've spent some time thinking about it. Um, often what we've seen in the current state of urban heat is that satellite imagery are often the quickest, least expensive ways to characterize differences in uh, temperature across a urban region. And the satellites, as you heard from the uh, previous uh, session, the part one, that is, um, it's, you can get it, um, you know, frequently, it's free, and it, and even though there's a difference that we've been able to note between satellite and ground-based measurements, that still, it still is something to be able to begin a conversation about those differences. And so if the goal is to really move forward in advancing and socializing this concept of urban heat locally, then satellite images offer a, a window into that right away. With this approach, it is, uh, um, it, the resources are really on being able to conduct these campaigns, doing the analytics. Um, and so the lower, the alternative to measuring temperatures would of course probably be satellite based and it, in, inexpensive instruments um, are, um, we've seen some people um, purchase very, uh, small thermometers that they provide to community members and the community members are are essentially um, kind of local uh, they, they they install them locally and so you can see differences in temperature from one neighborhood to another but again this is very coarse and sometimes may not be as accurate because you're you're not having as many measurements across an urban region and the advantage to doing a mobile uh, campaign is that you get hundreds of thousands of measurements over a very short period of time. So that's that's what I have for question four. Um, question five, just moving on, um, for the random forest regression, how do you avoid overfitting? This can be tricky since there's high spatial autocorrelation. Yeah, so part of what we do is um, for for each of these areas, we actually look at the um, specific measurement that's taken and we draw multiple buffer rings around each of these measurements. And each of these buffer rings are developed in a model independently. There's an assumption that, um, that each of these buffer rings are independent uh, models, though we start at you know, uh, um, uh, 25 meter, 50 meter, uh, 100 meter, 150 meter, 200 meter, and these are buffer rings around an individual measurement. And so what we are finding is that these specific measurements allow, or these specific buffer rings allow us to then develop independent models and uh, to be able to predict for that specific measurement. And since we're doing that, um, admittedly, uh, random forest is a bit of a black box. It's not like it generates a a coefficient for each of these buffers or each of the bands. We have RMSE values that we can use um, to look at the importance of specific bands uh, which are related to specific land covers to the measurement of temperature or humidity, though um, it is running uh, thousands if not tens of thousands of computations um, in this algorithm to be able to come up with a, a predictive set of ver bands that would uh, help us discern how to apply this model to the rest of the urban region. So um, the spatial autocorrelation is something that we've looked at as well. The models seem to be holding up, um, even with the results we're looking at them, the models seem to be holding up reasonably well with um, spatial autocorrelation, at least tests with Moran's eye, Getty's Ord, and others that we've used. Um, what steps are being taken to have open data satellites with higher, uh, question six, what spatial, what steps are being taken to have open data satellites with higher spatial resolution, 10 meter for temperature monitoring and prediction? Um, that looks like we've already got an answer to that. I'll just quickly say that all of the data from NASA's fleet of satellites are freely available to the public. Uh, there is always compromise between spatial, temporal, and spectral, spectral resolution. NASA is scheduled to launch uh, Landsat's uh, 9 towards the end of the year, which will improve the temporal resolution of uh, land surface temperature derived products, but not improve the spatial resolution. 
the instruments on Landsat 9 are similar to those currently operating on Landsat 8. Okay, that's good to know. Um, can you report an R squared or significance for the observes, observers versus predicted temperature plots? Um, question seven. The, um, way, the way that random forest works, we don't get a, uh, re, uh, a traditional like ordinary least squared uh, R squared uh, in the model. What we do is we use, as, we, as I mentioned in the presentation, a 70-30 holdout method is one validation technique and the other is to look at uh, um, points around or measurements, stationary measurements around some of the uh, either comparing the models, as I was saying in the presentation, or uh, how well are the stationary measurements comparing to the mobile measurements. And so um, we don't get, it with this model, an R-squared uh, and significance value per se, it does allow us to compare our um, observed temperatures with what we're predicting. So we take 70% of the observed temperatures and try to predict 30%, which allows us to be a bit more um, um, internally consistent. Then to be externally validated, we look at local temperature sensors that are stationary. So it's not, um, it's not quite as easy as getting R squares like we would with cartographic regression models or ordinary least squared um, in that case. Um, have you done any correlations with UHI and ground level ozone? No, we haven't looked at that yet. Um, there is a lot of photochemistry that's happening in the atmosphere. We work with some atmospheric chemists, and um, I understand that there is a lot of complex interactions happening um, across the column, the stratosphere column, and that is something that we haven't done in our own work. Um, my hunch is that there, this is probably happening on a uh, at an altitude higher than where we are measuring, but that's um, that's debatable. I, I think that's fairly debatable. Um, but nevertheless, I think at the two meters above the ground level where we're measuring air temperatures, um, there might be a level of ground level ozone that uh, we could pick up on, but again, that's about instrumentation. We don't have currently instruments. We're building some air quality instruments to, uh, to couple with the, um, to air temperature instruments. Uh, this has been a, about a five years worth of work. We've been trying to get a mobile air quality instrument that is very reliable, works in C2 as well as in the lab and is very um, uh, very high in its in its accuracy. And we've we've I think we've narrowed it down to a couple of them that we're doing quite a bit of testing on right now. Um, I'm not sure what question nine is in terms of which dynamic model did you use. Um, I think the dynamic model may be the model, uh, random forest model um, is the response to that. Um, and then is the application used to evaluate the association of green interventions and, and heat available? Um, yes, so part of what we're doing with this is getting at um, getting at the role that different land covers play in, in determining heat. So in terms of green interventions, it's very localized, meaning it's on a street level, it's on a specific city block, or it's in a plaza or something like that. And so where we're going this 2021 is we're actually having um, um, people walk with temperature sensors um, attached to their bodies, and they're going to be walking in areas where a municipality is expecting to do and implement green measurements, uh, oh, I'm sorry, green interventions, uh, such as uh, street trees, such as sh um, some kind of a um, um, shading device or even albedo changing uh, systems where you're painting colors, lighter colors, and so we're actually go in order to do that. Our models are built are fitted at the regional scale, and so getting at interventions at the city block scale or or, or street level won't be a, won't really show up in a model that has these many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of measurements. And so what we're trying to do is allow folks to be walking and biking in areas where there are interventions, so we can concentrate the uh, measurement systems in an area where green interventions are 
are, are applied and then looking at those. We have done some complex fluid dynamics modeling and found that there are different forms of green interventions that could help ameliorate air temperatures. So that's something we've done on the modeling side. This year we're really doing a great deal of work on the uh, measurement at the very local side and we're able to use high resolution, often LIDAR derived data to look at the effects of those interventions. Um, moving down to question 11, um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using air temperature measurements to estimate land surface temperature? Oh, interesting. That's what we're trying to do now. Um, we have uh, developed, we're, we have now conducted I, about 32 of these heat campaigns across North America and parts of the Middle East. Um, this allows us to develop some pretty robust models um, for assessing the relationship between uh, land cover and air temperature. And now that we have land surface temperature, we're developing essentially a set of algorithms that help link land surface temperature to air temperature. And the advantage is simply that um, land, temp land surface temperature is free, but doing this is a bit more costly and both time and money. And so what we want to do is use a freely available product like land surface temperature from Landsat to be able to predict air temperature. And since we have exhaustive, spatially exhaustive um, data sets from the air temperatures, we can uh, use a series of these machine learning algorithms to assess in what conditions are the, are the air temperatures best, uh, what's, I'm sorry, what, what, what um, conditions are the land surface temperatures best predicting air temperatures? And so the advantage is that it's it's really a free and it'll allow it to be applied more generally to many different areas. The disadvantage is, of course, that um, we haven't covered all of the areas and all bioclimatic zones because a high uh, a high altitude with very different built environment, very different structures, very different road systems, etc., was going to be very different than a valley with very lush. Uh, greenery, et cetera. And so getting at all these unique microclimates across the world, if not just North America, where we've done most of these campaigns, is a very challenging proposition. And so we're still about a couple of years out from doing that, and that may be a disadvantage. Um, question 12, I would like to know if there, there were predictor variables other than sentinel bands used in the random forest model. Yeah, we uh, do uh, we do not at this point use other predictor variables. We know that these models work best on clear days with high um, with high pressure system. So usually a high pressure system does clear, create a clear day uh, for a region um, and with limited wind. So we know that those are important factors. And the fourth factor is a tricky one because it's about uh, elevation. We know that in areas that have a lot of topographical elevation, that that could be a factor. And yet um, getting at high resolution elevation data is not necessarily the easiest to do. Um, that's why we're kind of limited by these predictor variables because it's something we can apply to any region across the world. Um, what kind of data sets are required for the NVMet models? Um, Essentially, for the NVMet models, we need uh, a building. We need uh, we need information on the built environment. So that's building. Um, that's essentially building footprint. So how much area does the building take? How tall is the building? And what materials are the building uh, buildings made of? There's some default. There's some default um, materials that are part of the NVMet model, though we found that they're not necessarily accurate in terms of what uh, a specific building may be designed with. Also, the cities that are uh, default, ava default available in NVMet don't cover all the cities in the world, and therefore you're, you're approximating the type of bioclimatic region that the model is running in. 
Um, so for example, we don't have, in, in the city of Portland, Oregon, where I'm currently living, we don't have, NVMet doesn't have a Portland, Oregon default um, um, set of materials. So we had to go in and uh, the closest was Los Angeles, which as some of you may know, is in Southern California and has very different building materials. Um, and so we had to actually bring in the building materials for that were that the uh, buildings in Portland were designed under. And with Washington DC, it's yet another set of building materials. And so we have to work with local um, engineers usually to identify what the building materials are. And then from a spatial point of view, we can use a variety of things, whether it be Google Maps or other things to be able to um, design that specific city block. And it's not, NVMet is not something you run across an entire city. It's usually much more constrained to an individual city block. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Can you elaborate on what you think may be causing the differences in satellite versus ground data? Is it that ground measurements are hyperlocal? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. We spend a lot of time on this question um, right now because we are trying to develop a generalizable model for, as I was saying, predicting air temperature using uh, land surface temperature. Um, part of the reason we, we've looked at one major contributor and that is what is happening on the ground. And one of the things that satellite imagery may do, and we're, we're still trying to confirm this, but we're noticing that in built up areas with limited green spaces or open spaces or anything that has water associated to it, the satellite images tend to be a lot warmer, uh, meaning the surface temperatures tend to be predict tend to be described as a lot warmer than our air temperatures. And that's interesting to us uh, uh, for one reason, um, in part because the, the things that do have water in them tend to be predicted as much cooler than what we're observing in air temperatures. And that is something that from a biophysics point of view is interesting and from a thermodynamics point of view is very interesting because there may be some level of evapotranspiration that's happening with greenery and allowing um, water to be leaving the plant material. And therefore, when the satellite is picking up on it, it's hard to tell exactly what may be going on uh, in that um, in that tr kind of tropospheric uh, column that we're looking at and getting down and whether whether water is really driving some of that. That's the big hypothesis that we're looking at right now in terms of the difference between the land surface temperature and the um, air temperature. Measurements being hyperlocal may be part of it because um, you know these are these are 10 meter versus uh, 30 or, or larger uh, meter grid cells. And so there may be some differences, but we resampled the 10 meter to 30 meter and uh, even one kilometer we've resampled it to, to see that similar patterns of difference between land surface temperature and air temperature still do exist. And so I don't know if it's necessarily the hyperlocal issue. I think it may have something to do with what's, hap what's actually on the landscape and the extent to which water may be affecting it. Um, question 15, the presentation mentioned modeling air temperature from land temperature. Is there any benefit modeling the inverse relationship? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so taking air temperature and trying to uh, calculate land surface temperature. Um, we have not done that. I'm trying to think of if there's an, a, the question is, is there any benefit? Um, my sense is that um, land surface temperature can be derived relatively easily, um, um, but it, it, there is, a, I mean, there are ways of being able to get at land surface temperature with air temperature, maybe getting it at that 10 meter resolution or something like that. That could be a way to go. Um, um, one of the other issues that we're struggling with right now, ad admittedly, is the amount of mixing in the air column because as soon as land surface temperature gets warmed up, that two meters of air between the land surface temperature and where we're measuring the air temperature, there might be a great deal of mixing going on because of the diversity of uh, land covers in that patch of space, meaning if it could be uh, a lot of pavement right next to some green space, 
the green space may have water in it, which may be really cooling the green space. The pavement may be very hot. And that difference in temperature, as we know, might be creating some, some form of a, a micro gust of some kind or, or mixing that could happen. There's probably better technical ways of describing that that are beyond me. But nevertheless, it, 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 um, it's, it would be a little bit tricky to do that. I don't know what the benefit is to do the inverse relationship, at least off the top of my head. I'll think on that a bit, maybe come back to it. What are the mitigation options for overcoming slow cooling down areas of a city? Yeah, we're getting into the management side of things with this question. Um, the mitigation options often have to do with, um, uh, so in other words, it's saying it's not cooling down very fast. So that usually has to do with the materials that are on the land that have held on to that solar radiation, that shortwave radiation and have are not letting it go as quickly as other materials might. And so one of the simplest things you can do, or two of the simplest things you can do is um, just keep the radiation from reaching the materials. So blocking the uh, radiation from hitting that material is usually the easiest and most effective way to uh, reduce thermal gain of any material. So that's either through, I've seen people putting, you know, changing the color of a particular material. I've seen people putting shading structures in front of a material uh, from an architectural design point of view. I've seen others putting green walls, meaning like ivy and growing ivy along uh, the vertical aspects of it, or even greenery along the, the, uh, the, the flat surface areas as well. So just Keep preventing that solar radiation from reaching the material is usually, or reducing the amount of, it is probably one of the easiest ways to be able to um, mitigate that slow cooling in a particular uh, city block or even building. Um, can you summarize the generic pattern you find between land surface temperature and air temperature? using in situ mobile sensors. Um, yeah, so that's what I was saying earlier, is the pattern really has a lot to do with kind of what's on the landscape. Um, we found that, you know, um, it, the, the land surface temperatures also don't pick up humidity. And one of the things we're doing is measuring humidity in these uh, mobile campaigns. And when you combine relative humidity with um, air temperature, you can get at a heat index, which then really throws off some of the land surface temperature measurement. So if we're only looking at air temperature and not bringing in humidity at all, then the differences are largely based on what's, how much, uh, my, our speculation at this point is um, the generic pattern would be that the amount of built up versus uh, uh, green space or water or, or, or water contained feature on the landscape. So that can be open space, it could be hay pasture land, it could be agriculture, it could be um, trees, it could be shrubs. Those things really seem to be affecting um, what's going on. One subtle though important distinction that we notice is that when we're noticing watered grass from land surface temperature point of view comes out very different than very dry grass dry grass or dry open space, like not watered open space, tends to respond very similarly to very built out open space in terms of land surface temperature um, and, and in terms of um, air temperature. The open spaces are really interesting depending on how they're managed. And sometimes in an urban environment, some people may be managing green spaces, others with water, other people may be just leaving it alone. Um, so those are some generic patterns that we've picked up. Yeah, so is there a database to access NC2? Yes, there is. Uh, we push all of our data sets up publicly available onto a website called Open Science Framework, OSF. And that's Open Science Framework, OSF.org, I believe. Um, and that is a place where we take all of our tested, uh, cleaned data at their, um, that are used to predict these models and push them up onto the open science framework to be able to um, access those data. And again, we have every, uh, I feel like every year we're adding more. This last year we added 15 new um, 
areas to that as we did 15 in 2021, I mean 2020, and we likely will be doing similar or maybe more in 2021, um, depending on how much interest there is in this work uh, going forward. But that's where we're post pushing it all up. And so they're available. People are using them for various different applications. Uh, I've been working with several different universities in around the United States to uh, do and several masters and doctoral theses are coming out of some of these data sets because we want people to conduct further research on them and uh, therefore and hopefully improve them over time. Uh, which urban temperature remediation treatments have been best for cost benefit ratios? Ooh, that's one I uh, that's a hard one. I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Um, cost benefit ratios i mean that one of the least expensive i will go to options has been um trying to find um trying to find ways to uh increase greenery um that's i say that with a with with a little bit of caution in part because depending on the space there's some places that are highly built out and tearing up asphalt or concrete to put greening in is incredibly expensive um, though if there's available space for shading, that's usually one of the easiest options. And over time, a tr street tree, for example, will appreciate in its overall benefit to the community because it's providing more shade over time. Um, grass tends to be a little bit tricky because the amount of energy or resources required to maintain it, including watering it, uh, uh, cutting it, and you know, of course, if others, some people want to use fertilizers for it. I mean, these are things that add up costs as well. Um, people have looked to cool surfaces. There's a, a few groups that I'm looking to for this. Is one is the uh, global cool um, global cool cities. Um, what's it called? Global Kurt Schickman um, global cool cities initiative um or cool cities coalition i forget what that last word is but global cool cities if you were to look that up on an internet browser you would find it they're doing a bunch of really interesting studies on the cost benefit aspects and so is another group called smart surfaces um i'm not i'm not advocating for each of the either of those i'm actually just suggesting them as places to look for at least starting to get at a comprehensive um comprehensive set of data that may be available for you to review um, we can calculate urban heat islands from different indices such as surface urban heat island and urban heat island. My question is, are those indexes comparable? Yeah, so that's similar to the question, like how do you know, I mean, in essence, um, by calculating urban heat islands in all these different ways, how do we actually know that they're um, useful um, and are they comparable? So I, that's a really hard question in part because um, it varies a lot um, by region. We found we've done campaigns in Albuquerque and the results are very different than the campaigns done in New York are very different than LA. And so these indexes are really very based on um, what the conditions are, altitude, topography, wind, um, um, and, in, and in aspect uh, with topography is really interesting. Um, and then of course, in relation to um, the actual land cover itself, what's there. And Albuquerque is very different, uh, uh, sh uh, a shrub step landscape with very small cact cactuses and very dry arid land versus you know, an area that could be in Vermont or, or, uh, or British Columbia or even Southern Mexico. I mean, very different um, land covers. And so we're really um, attempting to understand those differences in indices. And right now that's a big area of research is how do these uh, indices vary? Um, do you have any predictive models related to urban hands or related to? Yeah, so that's, um, do you have any predictive models related to urban heat islands or related to land use land cover? Um, yeah, so that's that's essentially it. We're, we're trying, th this whole random forest model is a predictive model uh, that attempts to take land use, land cover, and apply it in an algorithm to predict UHI, um, so that uh, air temperature essentially. Um, so yeah, that's that's a pretty easy question based on what we're already doing. The UHI research community has developed its own characterization scheme called land 
cover classification zone. Yeah, local climate zones. Yep. Um, I think it's LCZ is local climate zone, not land cover zone, classification zone. I'm curious if you have investigated that characterization scheme in addition to NLCD. Yeah, so we have a project right now uh, 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 linking our air temperature with L LCZ Zs, and that allows us to um, understand what's going on at that local level. Again, lang local climate zones are still relatively coarse in their description. Um, we are trying to get down to the hyper-local, meaning the household or street level, because part of the concern is that people standing at bus stops, people walking their children to school on certain streets or walking home from school uh, will be very hot and there might be alternative routes people can take or, or interventions that can be made. And so our goal has really been about trying to um, reduce the public health impacts. And so local climate zones are helpful from an academic research point of view. I haven't found them to be particularly helpful for uh, the kind of public health and very localized, hyper-local applications that we're striving to, um, to address. And so, yeah, we are looking at that and maybe you can make a hyper HLCZ, hyper-local climate zone with some of these data, but that's still work in progress. Um, I realize I'm not gonna be able to get through all of these questions um, in the time I have available here. I have to leave in about nine minutes um, to take my son to, uh, to, to his, uh, uh, his school uh, pod, his other household where he'll do school today. Um, is there a benefit? Let me just see how many more I can get through. Is there, um, great. Um, is there a benefit in including air quality measurements and air temperature? Yes, so we are right now looking at air quality measurements um, in part because, again, if this is a public health application, we wanna know areas that are both really polluted and really hot because a lot of people with pre-existing health conditions or older adults, if they're inhaling really high levels of pollutant during a hot period, that further compromises your respiratory system and can be very, fatal for some communities. And so what we wanna do is find ways to couple the two. And we have a few projects that have used um, stationary sources of air quality data and combine that with mobile sources of air temperature data, though we're really wanting to couple the two in terms of the same methodology that's used for collecting both sets of data. Um, so that's something we're We'll be doing in 2021. In fact, we have a we're working with a company now to develop sensors that allow us to to um, co combine the two. How do vehicular emissions affect urban heat island? That's yeah. The anthropogenic side of this is interesting. There's building HVAC systems that will push hot air into a street canyon uh, or something like that, or onto a street, and also vehicle emissions. They do affect. Um, they do affect very, very local level of um, urban heat. However, what we're trying to get at, and I'm working with Lawrence Berkeley Lab, um, a project that we're looking to start on, on um, combining, they just published a paper on looking at anthropogenic, modeling anthropogenic heat in um, urban areas. And we're looking to see to what extent is the anthropogenic, like vehic vehicular traffic, or vehicular emissions combined with even the built environment like buildings contributing to some of these results. My hunch is that it's probably less than 10%, maybe even less than, or uh, I mean, maybe less than 20%, less than, and maybe even less than 20% it, overall on the model, um, in part because uh, the amount of um, emissions coming out, as well as the, even in a highly crowded area, well, while uh, we would be picking up on that, there's also a, a, a air column that's mixing a lot of this up relatively quickly, not to mention the fact that most of the anthropogenic emissions are coming out from a, a, a kind of a wind-based method, meaning they're being pushed out of a building, pushed out of a car. So there's further mixing that happens. And we do know there's an effect, but um, we're still trying to tease out how much that effect is overall on the regional scale. Um, I have a question regarding instruments uh, they used in heat 
watch campaign, how did they achieve one second data and how is it connected to response time of the instrument? So we've spent a fair bit of time on this question because the first eight to eight to 10 years of our research was looking at instrumentation and trying to find a high response time as well as uh, high response time in terms of not only data logger and also GPS. So keep in mind that a person is driving at a very steady speed. We're asking them to drive uh, not faster, at least in the U.S. context, not faster than 35 miles per hour uh, and not slower than about 10 miles an hour. And any of the stop, any time their uh, drivers are stopping, we remove all of those data and we essentially trim those data as one part of the data quality check. But the uh, instruments are essentially um, sending signals down to a data logger, which then is stored on an SD card right away. We're not sending it, at least at this point, via a cell tower or anything like that. Um, but we have essentially a um, thermocouple unit that allows us to collect those data sets uh, locally on each of the instruments. Um, and the instruments are designed to collect at one uh, second. The firmware that's set up allows the instrument to pick up on that interval as well as to um, ensure uh, response time is within the grid cell um, that they're driving through. How did you use random force to interpolate the temperature measurements? This is an important point. We don't interpolate. That's a technical term used in various data science fields. Um, interpolation uh, in, in, in the classic sense at least doesn't take into account um, all the land cover characteristics that we are uh, also bringing into the random forest model. We are actually creating an entirely locally based model, not only using the air temperature measurements, because if you add an air temperature measurement of 30 degrees Celsius in one area and 40 degrees in another area, an interpolation may say that the area in between is 35 degrees, um, essentially averaging the two. By bringing in uh, our random forest land cover data, we're actually looking at what is underneath that 40 Celsius, 30 Celsius, and predicted 35 Celsius. What's underneath that? If it's a park, it may be very different. It may actually be 27 degrees in between the 30 and the 40 Celsius. And so we're not interpolating the air temperature. And I think that's a common misnomer that happens when we're going out and collecting these temperatures. Um, the, the land cover really is driving much of what we're trying to predict on the ground. Yeah, so 27 is similar to one that I answered before, a local climate zone. Don't want to get into that too much. Um, what is the difference between local scale urban heat and urban heat island? Uh, don't quite understand that question. Um, local scale urban heat, um, I mean, urban heat island you could describe in the classic sense as the difference between the city and the surrounding area. That was question number one that was posed. Um, what we're saying is that there's an intra-urban variation of temperatures, meaning that one block of a city may be different than another block of the city based on what was happening, not only in the development of those places, but also what is how those places are being managed right now. And so that um, local scale urban heat island is really about getting, in my description at least, the intra-urban variation of temperatures as opposed to the city versus the surrounding area. Because ultimately we want to design our cities for people and for, uh, if we're designing our cities for people, we want to make sure that the people are healthy and well and um, not overheating. Um, and so that intra-urban is really important here. Can we measure heat index near wetland areas? What do we call that index? Yeah, wetland areas are tricky. Water, by and large, is one of the trickiest things. Water is so beautiful and so complicated in so many ways. It is, um, when you're actually um, above the water surface, the water and even wetlands, you're reflecting a lot of the sun's radiation away, right? So you're creating that reflection process, which then the air temperature around and a wet area may be higher than the actual water itself. And so what you're picking up on then is an air temperature of something that's being reflected. And so arguably it could be even hotter right above the water surface than necessarily a grassy surface adjacent to it. Wetland where you have a lot of marshy areas maybe, that complicates things because you're getting a lot of disturbance in the water surface itself. And the, and the reflectivity of the water may vary depending on how much shade it has and how much 
just how much uh, vegetation or other materials may be on the water's surface. So wetland areas are pretty complicated, I think, from a uh, thermodynamics point of view as well as kind of a measurement point of view and I have no idea what we would call that index. Um, I could come up with some creative names I guess but um, ah boy we're right at time here I could keep going but there's a there's another 10 questions I don't think I'm gonna get to maybe what I can do is just um, come back to this and and see if I can respond and fill out this document and you can post it up somewhere. All right. Great, Jack, thank you so much. We, we we appreciate so much you taking the time, and we, we know that we are at the hour, so we will end it. But to all the participants, uh, we will fill out the rest of these question and answer, and we will post it uh, at the conclusion. So at the end of next week's training, we will have the Q&A doc up on the website. But again, thank you so much, Vivek, for, for uh, not only presenting, but sticking around to answer all these uh, great questions that were presented from our participants. And also big thanks to uh, Dr. Amita Mekta for uh, presenting and helping out with this, as well as Brock Levins, Jonathan O'Brien, and Selwyn hudson Odoy for all their work behind the scenes making this such a success. So please stay tuned next Tuesday. We'll see you at the same time one week from now for the final uh, part of this webinar series on urban heat island and have a wonderful day.